This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. <gasps> Hi there, boys and girls. I hope you're having a lovely Halloween. I know I am, because I get to sit here and talk to you today about clowns and how common they seem to be nowadays. I love seeing clowns everywhere, especially in video games, and there's a long history to that that goes back a really long time. I guess we shouldn't delay because we've only got so long to talk about them today. Yes, this is where Halloween has led me this year. What about it? You might be under the impression that the frequency with which creepy, bloodthirsty clowns are cropping up in popular culture, that we'd all become collectively desensitized to something that people have found disturbing for decades. To me, it's only natural that this is a trope that video games have run away with and done some incredibly creepy things with, actually. Gaming is all about overcoming conflict, which is something different to real life where the average clown isn't supposed to get in your way. So maybe that's why they're so angry. And do you know what I do when I'm not peeling the flesh off of small children? I play Raid Shadow Legends, and let me tell you, this game is so good, I sometimes forget to defrost the body part that I keep in my freezer for dinner. I don't know how much you know about mobile games, but forget all of it, because one of the most ambitious RPG projects of 2019 has just been released, and damn, it's pretty incredible. This is Raid Shadow Legends, the most immersive and involved experience you'll find on a smartphone that can only really be compared with the biggest PC and console titles. Except in this case, it's totally free. Raid doesn't skimp on the details and is in fact jam-packed with them, like an amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. Even with all these features, it runs very smoothly with no frame drops. Over 10 million players worldwide have already downloaded the game in less than six months. Each champion has been designed with a lot of detail and they look great with these graphics. In Raid, you have the ability to personally customize your champions, choosing their artifacts and creating a unique mastery build for each one of them. It's impressive that everyone can find something for themselves. Some love collecting characters, some are all about the deep storyline and graphics, and I'm personally down for always growing my character and there's always new abilities and skills to learn, and that is really satisfying, let me tell you. I've been having a lot of fun with Raid for a while now, but you don't just have to take my word for it. With over 300,000 reviews, Raid has almost a perfect score on the Play Store. The game is growing incredibly quickly, and the highly anticipated new Faction Wars feature is live right now. You can find me in the game under the name Rabid Luigi, and if you're quick enough, you can also join my clan. Plus, there's this very helpful rewards program for new players, where you can get a new daily login bonus for the first 90 days in the game. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the special links, and if you're a new player, you'll get 100,000 silver, one energy refill, 50 gems, and one free champion executioner. Guys, just, just look at him. They're giving you him for free. That's really good. All this treasure will be waiting for you here, so hurry up. These rewards are relevant for only 30 days. I'll see you all in the raid. Anyway, clowns. Creepy, aren't they? I expected a lot of things from my first time playing Deltarune. As the de facto sequel to Undertale, that's the only way you can approach this game, and it can often be very hard to separate these two Toby Fox games for tone and aesthetic design. So yeah, you're coming to Deltarune expecting another interesting take on RPG combat and more great writing that helps endear lovable characters to you, and also... a super boss? Undertale had a couple that put up enough of a fight to leave a lasting impression, so I think it's perfectly natural to expect something very similar in the sequel. I don't think many people expected Jevil, though. If just because the superbosses in Undertale had plot relevance and had a degree of build-up and anticipation to them that isn't really matched by Jevil. The trade-off is a greater sense of mystery, as you meet Jevil for the first time and talk to a seemingly random shopkeeper for more information, and find out that Jevil was possessed by some strange force, whereupon he started viewing the world as a game, leading to him being locked up. Since video games are the way they are, you set him free and quickly get sparring with Jevil, and it really doesn't take long to notice how chaotic everything is. Jevil is Deltarune's superboss, and he really leans into it, distorting the environment and playing by a set of rules unlike any fight in the game. 
His appearance isn't too wild, but a clown-like creature with godlike powers? I I don't want to fuck with that. I don't even I don't want to think what that would mean for me. Chapter two is gonna be wild, that's for sure. I'd like to take some time out to talk about childhood trauma, which I think is at least some of the reason why people are scared of clowns in the first place. Clowns never really clicked with me as something to be inherently scared of as a kid, but I was exposed to a lot of clown-like figures in my childhood that all had something off about them. Generally, I was alright with them, but I think I speak for most people when I say that seeing Mr. Mime for the first time isn't likely to be something that you'll forget in a hurry. Nah, it's fine, you've got a bunch of cute creatures, some weird blobs of crap, the occasional legendary Pokemon, and then a clown called Mr. Mime. Questions, lots of questions. The existence of Mr. Mime comes with more questions than answers, and they've been making humanoid Pokemon for quite a while now, and they continue to do to this day, if just to keep the furries at bay. But Mr. Mime is a unique case that warrants more explanation than simply, hey, here at Game Freak, we just really like clowns. Is that so bad? When this is the end result, I'd argue it is, yeah. There's some odd Pokemon designs in the first generation of Pokemon, but with Mr. Mime being clearly based on a mime artist, and more broadly on a clown, you're opening up a whole Pandora's box of creepiness. Mr. Mime's whole shtick is that he's really good at being a mime, and his psychic typing helps him to go beyond the usual routine of pretending there's a wall in front of him, and actually making an invisible wall. Which is cool, and a nice combination of ideas that makes Mr. Mime slightly more of an organic fit as a Pokemon, until you look into it further and find out that Mr. Mime does this as a way of conning and manipulating his target. Coupled with a face like that and hands that are too big, and you start to feel more and more uncomfortable with what Mr. Mime is and could potentially do. No, I didn't need him made realistic, but thanks anyway, Detective Pikachu, really good job with that. I can't pretend this is okay. Most of this video is alright, because you can prepare yourself for what you're getting into. Either characters have prominent roles in the games that they're in, or they suit the tone of the game so well that you can't say that you never saw a creepy clown coming. The exception, as is often the case in life, is to be found in a Wario game, when Wario Land 3 spends the whole of the game throwing fairly standard looking enemies at you that can't kill you because of how this game handles health, and yet is kind enough to save a creepy clown for the final boss who can trigger a game over. Oh, how considerate of you. The plot of Wario Land 3 is pretty dark, since you know from the start that you're aiding the bad guy by collecting music boxes and ultimately removing the seal on some crazy clown god, with the payoff being that Wario is allowed to leave this world and go home. Once he's free, Rudy the Clown reveals that he's turned all of the inhabitants into the monsters that Wario defeated during his adventure, so not only is he very powerful, but pretty goddamn cruel when you think about it too much. Then you see him, and his skin is way too green, and his teeth are way too red, and when you inflict damage, his eyes bulge out of their sockets, and all I can think is that I'd be having a much more comfortable time if I wasn't fighting a giant clown god. I do miss these games for their unique style of platforming and Wario having his own spin-off series that isn't all about mini-games, but moments like this, I, I realise that I'm alright with how things are now. Put that thing back where it came from. I can tell you don't believe him when I say that clowns have been terrifying monstrosities for absolute decades, but they honestly have. History is a little vague on this trope's true origin, but I think a combination of the Joker's influence in 1940s comic books and John Wayne Gacy's stint as a clown-shaped serial killer has helped to shape the concept that we know and fear to this day. The first creepy clown in a video game is a little hard to pin down, since most early games had a low pixel count and it was a little tricky to accurately portray a clown with enough murderous intent to be convincing. Then again, 1984 arcade hit Snacks and Jackson made it look oh so easy. It's not a complicated game, you play as Jackson the Box, who is a very hungry clown man who, for some reason, loses his big red nose whenever he eats something. 
So you need to juggle eating all of this food with picking up your nose every time, which is the kind of plate spinning variety act that makes these kind of games so much fun. It's innocent and lovely, except for the teeny tiny detail that, oh, I don't know, the clown's horrifying neck. Look, I know you need Jackson to be able to reach all of this delicious food, but surely there was a way to do this without using this much body horror? I'm now calling into question why Jackson has a weird stretchy neck when I should be enjoying a fun little game about a hungry clown. Is this cheese or is it human skin? I'm not so sure anymore. There's so much naivety here. Clearly, Snacks and Jackson wasn't intended to be a horror game, and yet the decision was taken to give him a stretchy neck anyway. I don't really understand why, but this is just what happened in the 1980s. This blind stumbling around for creativity, it made some ridiculous video games. At least they weren't being racist. The war on drugs in the US in the 1980s had a fascinating impact on some of the video games of the day. Developers were mostly allowed to do what they wanted, but some games were specially commissioned to paint drug and drug users in a negative light to help promote the idea of a drug-free America. Which is fine, but the ways in which this manifested itself was often bizarre and sometimes extremely violent for no discernible reason. 1988's NARC took the radical approach of convincing impressionable young people that hyperviolence and graphic deaths is the only way to kick drugs off the street. And hey, they might have a point, but I feel like it's being replaced by something far worse. Not that we have to worry about this, since one of the agents that work for the crime syndicate is a psycho clown called Kinky Pinky, so... Priorities. This game is absolutely bananas, but if I tell you that a legion of killer clowns that all share the same name, and I presume the same hive mind, is not the weirdest boss fight in the game, you're just gonna have to take my word for it. There's a lot going on in any average screen in NARC, but damn, when Kinky Pinky shows up and starts shuffling across the screen looking for women to abduct, I'll admit that I struggle to process everything as it happens. I mean, this game has enough creepy undertones without a collection of blood spattered clowns holding kitchen knives. And hey, how does the whole Legion thing work anyhow? Clowns are horrifying enough without them sharing a collective thought and conspiring against me en masse. One clown is bad, many clowns is a big problem. I'd argue it's more of an epidemic than any amount of drugs. Every single one of the clowns that I'm talking about today are NPCs or non-player characters. There's an inbuilt unpredictability about NPCs since you have no control over them and you have no idea what they're gonna do next, which works perfectly for a mildly murderous clown with intentions of creeping you the fuck out. The exception comes from a really interesting source in a scenario that I had no clue was coming up. Fallout 3 has a fairly wild main campaign that drags you from pillar to post just so you can march on the Jefferson Memorial with a giant killer robot on your side. But a little while before that, you stumble across Vault 112 and its advanced virtual reality simulation that puts you in control of a killer clown. So that's cool, I guess. In an inspired stroke of world building meeting practical, playable gameplay segments that have since been left to one side in newer games in favour of OH WOW NUKES, the whole segment with the pint sized slasher is one of the single most surreal shifts that any game has ever implemented. One many all roaming the wastelands of 23rd century America looking for adventure and random shit to fill your pockets with. And the next you're thrown into Tranquility Lane, a virtual simulation of a quaint pre-war village where you terrorise its residents as the pint-sized slasher. Things start out innocuously but soon devolve into chaos as you go on a killing spree and stab everyone in the village to death. It's already a pretty jarring mission, but the fact that you're slicing your way through residents as this clown faced psycho just makes it all the more uncomfortable. The caveat is that the civilians you're killing are the residents of Vault 112 that have been kept in stasis, and that murdering them as the pint sized slasher is actually a mercy killing and sets them free. This doesn't apply to everyone in the world before any of you clowns get any funny ideas. Mario games are like the sleeper hits of creepy stuff. You wouldn't think it, since Mario is optimistic 24-7 and never spends too long being creeped out by whatever scary thing is being thrown at him, but you wouldn't be surprised how dark some of these games get. 
Whether it's the flesh-hungry piano from Mario 64 or the actual dead baby in Luigi's Mansion, there's always little nuggets of creepiness hiding in plain sight for everyone to be horrified at. Super Paper Mario is consistently one of the darkest Mario games ever made, where characters genuinely die and worlds cease to exist and everyone just kinda rolls with it because it's Mario and who can say no to that face? And yeah, but then Dementio slides into the position of number one antagonist and starts weaving an intricate plot to use the Chaos Heart for his own agenda. He's a bit different from the other bad guys by the fact that he knows what he's doing. And that's really dangerous. The court jester getup is almost an aside considering how Dementio struts around the place, casually being one of the few characters in any game to successfully kill the Mario Bros, but his outfit does do a good job of acting as shorthand for how playfully confident Dementio is with everything he does. He's a master manipulator, successfully pitting two sides against each other so he can strike when they're both vulnerable and create whatever the fresh hell this is. And honestly, I think Super Paper Mario is a better game for having a villain so unrelentingly evil. Count Black turns sympathetic towards the end, leaving Dementio to creep out the shadows and take full control. He's responsible for some of the most shocking images in this game, and I'm personally kinda happy for it. Because not enough people like this game, apparently. And there's lots of reasons why you should. While I like my clowns like I enjoy my golf, crazy, I can also appreciate a clown that has a bit more complexity under the surface. You see, not only do you get a clown that looks a bit weird and acts a bit weird, but they have a degree of self-control and they understand what they need to do in order to achieve their goals of world domination or whatever it may be. You see, that way, it's creepier because they're a great villain, but they also look like a clown. I think the best endorsement of Kefka Palazzo is that I sometimes forget where he came from. He's introduced fairly early in Final Fantasy VI as a high-ranking general and yet looks like a colourful idiot. Like some kind of court jester that somehow found himself in a position of authority in Emperor Gestahl's army. It's only later down the line when Kefka's true motives show themselves and he betrays Gestahl and enacts his plan of world destruction. Not domination, actual mass destruction on a global scale since Kefka is less of a maniacal leader and more of a nihilistic psychopath with hate coursing through every fibre of his being. You know, like most clowns. The added bonus with Kefka is that he succeeds with virtually every part of his plan without swaying from his twisted philosophy on life. It's a pretty shocking thing to see in a game from the mid-90s since for a large part of Final Fantasy VI, this is Kefka's story, really. You see him start as a bit of a joke, potentially a comic relief bad guy, before he slowly starts to show his true self as he cruelly burns soldiers alive and poisons water supplies. When he brings down his big death laser on the Earth later in the game, it just feels like the natural progression of events for Kefka, as he becomes the sadist he was always threatening to be. It's a bit odd because you look at his design and he doesn't look like one of the creepiest clowns that gaming's ever seen, but you burrow even slightly under the surface and it all comes out for everyone to see. I just think he's having a bit too much fun, is all. Do you know what clowns really don't need? Um, weapons. They're not required in order to put on a show for children, and if any clown approaches with a hammer or chainsaw, I recommend walking calmly in the other direction and maybe contacting the relevant authorities. Weapons play a big part in the first Dead Rising, and damn near everything in the game can be picked up and used to fight back zombies. The problem is that ace war reporter Frank West isn't the only one making do with whatever he can find to survive the zombie apocalypse, since there are in fact many other psychopaths that are more than willing to use makeshift weapons to fend off threats. Or just a clown with dual chainsaws. I guess the intention was to make Dead Rising psychopaths reasonably threatening and an example of how different people can react to the overwhelming threat of zombie conversion. And on the extreme end of the scale lies Adam McIntyre, a former mall clown who went insane when zombies ate his audience and slipped into the standard insane clown with double chainsaws archetype that we all love to see. Honestly, when he creeps up behind Frank juggling chainsaws with that permanently etched smile, I'd rather not, I'm gonna be honest. Adam can breathe fire and throw knives as well as swing those chainsaws around for massive damage and it's at this point that I realise that I don't like the way that Adam leaps around the place all erratically and unpredictably. 
Maybe it's no surprise then that he dies by falling on his own chainsaws and painting the floor with his insides, laughing all the while. I don't know if you need a standard for insane video game clowns at this point in this video, but here you go. But you're glad you're ass now, aren't you? I maintain that any trope like this will always have a quintessential example, something that you can look at and think, oh yeah, this is definitely what I should be picturing in my head when someone talks about creepy clowns in video games. There's some that would argue that the likes of Kefka or Adam McIntyre helped to define what creepy clowns look and act like in video games, but to do so would be doing a great disservice to a little game called Twisted Metal. Or actually, a series of games that all seem to be very similar experiences where you chase around in hefty vehicles, armed to the teeth, and blow the crap out of each other. But hey, did you know these games have stories? And actually a terrifyingly creepy mascot? Sweet Tooth, or Needles Cane, since Sweet Tooth is actually the name of his ice cream truck, which everyone gets wrong and it's really annoying, is frankly the killer clown of video games. It's basically his main deal ever since Marcus Kane developed Dissociative Identity Disorder and was taken over by his dark side, causing him to murder his own family. Or at least most of his family since he taunted and teased his daughter until she fought back and got away. Nowadays, he relentlessly chases her down, slaughtering everyone in his path with no hesitation or remorse. Needles just really enjoys killing people, getting an almost giddy pleasure from ending lives and relishing every second of it. And it's a shame that the Twisted Metal games haven't lent more into that idea. Nah, instead we got cars bashing into each other and twisting those metals. Seriously, you make a game like Hatred, where Needles Kane drives around and puts machetes in people and you might just have something there. Whether or not you really want that is entirely up to you. This has been Rabid Luigi, and the craziest thing about Sweet Tooth is how often they changed the design in order to lean into his deranged personality. He started off as just this ordinary looking clown, just a standard slightly crazy looking weirdo, but they decided that if he was to go on killing sprees and overpower people and kill them, that he needed to buff up a little bit and look a bit more insane. And we see this look now, it's iconic, and it's been in so many games that we love and respect it, and frankly, it's a bit inspirational.